everyone are going to settle in. Uh, let's start with a few questions, because it's always fun. So with a raise of hand, uh, how many people are using Jupyter Notebooks? Yeah, OK, you're here in this session, obviously. Um, on those Jupyter Notebooks, how many of you are collaborating with other people on the same project? OK, less. How, same notebook on the same project. And how many of you are doing it to deploy that model that you're building to production? Yeah, building in the notebook. OK, yeah, very, very little. That was uh, what I imagined. Um, cool, so Jupyter Notebooks, uh, born out of the IPython back in 2014. They've become the de facto standard tool for data scientists to build their projects. To give you the sense of its impact, Jupyter Notebooks was, was awarded the 2017 ACM Award, which is the, a prestige uh, award shared with Java, Unix, and the web. However, using it to build ML project and application for production has introduced challenges that we have never encountered before. The new and undefined format, structure, and workflow revealed blind spots that made its usage in production environment an uphill battle. Um, and in our session today, we're gonna discuss about seven best practices that will help us reduce or shorten the time between our research tape to moving to production, and we're gonna use MLOps tools and techniques. So a few words about me. I'm Nir Barazida. Uh, thank you all for joining the session today. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I paid him to do that. Uh, my background combines uh, structural analysis, computer vision engineering, and MLOps research. Uh, I'm leading the MLOps and outreach team at Dagzub. So shout out to all the Dagzub team that are here, uh, which is basically the GitHub for ML. And my team is researching and implementing MLOps solutions and workflows for collaborative ML. And in this session, oh, wait, one click and another click. Awesome. And basically, in this session today, I aim to bring you the essence of what we've learned about using Jupyter Notebooks when building machine learning models in production environment. And so far, the hypothesis that had the highest st statistical significance was that the hypothesis that had the highest statistical significance is that when the best way to get data scientist attention is by using three words. MLOps, notebooks, and production. And today, today we're going to have them all. So I'd like to start with the dark side of notebooks, and from there move to, towards the light. And hopefully this slide is not going to be a heavy train that is headed our way. And talking about the bad side of, or the dark side of Jupyter Notebooks, with notebooks we can run out of order cells, edit them after we already ran them once, and this is a huge disadvantage for reproducibility. And it makes us, to put, we need to put a lot of effort into tracking the kernel state when executing it. Also behind the scenes, Jupyter Notebooks are basically a very large JSON file, which makes it very hard to diff and track or version with Git. And last, the code hosted in the Jupyter Notebooks can't be called outside the notebook, making it very hard to test and to reuse our code in other projects. So why are we using Jupyter Notebooks? I just throw them out of the window and go back to the good old fashioned IDE. Well, Jupyter Notebooks basically gives us some superhuman abilities and are after all a very good tool. They give us an interactive way to work with our code. They have built-in visualizations that makes that we can see the results of our code, uh, the result of uh, our code next to the cell that already ran it. And this is very good for communicating our work to other colleagues and to not so technical stakeholders. And basically, Jupyter Notebooks are great for quick prototyping, so our sandbox environment. And now that we understand that Jupyter Notebooks are good, but also have their dark, dark side, how can we utilize them and make the use of them more productive when we are in a production environment? So based on our research, we found that by using seven best practices, it will make the research time or the productionizing time uh, shorter. The first is host our code in modules, which basically means take all the code that we are hosting in the notebook to Python modules. 
that doesn't rely on any global variable and take everything as argument and then import it back. We're going to see how it, uh, we're going to see it in just a minute. We like to version everything, so our code, our data, our models, our experiments, basically everything. We want to have peer review, so someone that is reviewing our work. We want to track our experiments. We want to use task-oriented notebooks, so not this spaghetti notebook that has thousands of cells. So we want to break it based on the task that we're using it for. We want to track our environment setting, and last, use scripts for training and deployment. And to make this seven best practices more practical, let's take a common scenario. And in our scenario, our team lead just got off the phone with the CEO, and there is a new project in the funnel. Save the planet. Surprisingly, the CEO wants it in production by end of week because it's a freaking game changer. So what are you going to do now, huh? You're going to roll up your sleeves. You're going to put on your headset. You're going to find the perfect gem for this task. You're going to open a new desktop, and you're going to run to get some coffee. No, I'm kidding. You're probably going to download the, no the data set to your local machine. You're going to fire a Jupyter notebook, and you're going to start exploring the data at hand. But hold your horses, cowboys. This is not your first rodeo. You, over, you already created a one-of-a-kind, never heard of data plots and analysis. But where are they? So you're going to probably start firing up old Jupyter notebooks, scroll through dozens of cells and output, looking through hundreds of code lines just to find that one function that does what you intended it to do. But although witnessing the outstanding work, and I'm sure that you're doing outstanding work, that you did back a few months back, it's highly time consuming. And what we want is an easy way to search for the pieces of code that we need and import it back or reuse it in our project. And this, among other good reasons, we want to move our code to Python modules. And what do I mean by that? So once we got our initial piece of code to do what it was intended to do, so in this case, we had an amazing plot of global warming distribution, what we want to do, we want to take this piece of code to a Python script, put it in a, a, a function that doesn't rely on any global variable and takes everything as argument. And then we want to import that function back to our Jupyter notebook and provide it the relevant variables. And by doing that, we will first and foremost be able to use uh, lin, so static code analysis, to flag programming errors. And for me, it's basically like testing, but it takes us to the next point, which is we'll be able to run unit tests on our code, making it uh, uh, better. Uh, and so we won't fail in production. And last, we're going to stay dry. And in the Israeli winter, that it's very rainy, not, uh, we won't repeat ourselves. So uh, we will be able to reuse our code in the same project or in other projects very easily, because it's basically importing a function from a Python module can also be R or Julia, but this is PyData, so I'm not going to mention other languages. Um, cool. So now that we can move faster without breaking anything, uh, sorry, Mark Zuckerberg, for uh, uh, ruining your hypothesis, we can start exploring our data. But what should we do when we're going to reach a good result or a dead end? Should we just take the piece of code, copy it, and paste it at the bottom of the notebook? or maybe Stone Age version our notebook, so just like copy and paste the notebook, give it like a unique name, EDA from December 2022, and then go back to it when we want it. But only if there was the magical tool that enables version control and going back in time with code. Oh, right, we have Git for it. So, yeah, I had to click, so this is a very cool meme. Um, so, with Git, we can work in isolated environment, we can recover work, we can use CI CD automation, and the list just goes on and on. Git is very, very good for version control and for managing project that has code. But remember, this is not a software development project. This is a machine learning project. Uh, the, other than our code files and our notebooks in this case, we also have other components such as models, such as data, such as pipelines, etc. And in most cases, those components are going to be the focal point of our experiments when we'd like to reproduce them. So because of that, what we want to do, we want to version everything. And for data versioning or for large file versioning, a lot of tools emerge in recent years that, for, that provide 
very good solutions for specific uh, tasks. So some provide better solution for uh, unstructured data, the other for tabular data, and the list just goes on and on. Yeah, you can take pictures. Um, don't forget to add mention. Um, so basically, there's a tons of very good open source tools out there and some not open source that helps us to version uh, our large files. Some are good for specific use cases. So what I recommend in this case, research for the tool that fits your needs before using it or injecting it into your pipeline. And by versioning everything, we'll be able to avoid ad hoc versioning, so no more copying, pasting, or Stone Age versioning. We'll be able to share our large files easily. So it can be a git commit or uh, a version of your data very easily within the team. And we're also going to be able to reproduce our results because we know which data set was used to train our model. And then we version also our model. So all we need to do is go back to that experiment. And we have everything that was used in that experiment. And so we broke down, explored, and tested our data to create the Mona Lisa of reports. Really, it's a thing of beauty. And now we feel comfortable, comfortable enough to start processing our data. But what if we missed something? What if there's a hidden bias in our work? Or our hypothesis is not, very, it's not truly supported by the data at hand? So what we want to do, we want, to, we want our work to be passed under the magnifying glass of our colleagues. An important step that as data scientists, we sometimes neglect or, uh, or, or not doing because it's very hard to do. How can someone review our notebook? How can we communicate over our notebook? Um, can we diff notebooks? So in this case, um, what we're using under the hood at DAGSUB for notebook diffing is NBDIME. On top of that, we added uh, the ability to also comment on notebook cells. There's a lot of add-ons, uh, such as also review NB, that I know this is the extension that GitHub uses. So there's a lot of tools and extension to our Jupyter notebooks out there that will enable code review, but this is something that we shouldn't miss because think of it, this is connected to a software development project. No one is going to deploy anything to production without having peer review. So the same in data science or machine learning projects. And by doing that, we're going to reduce the bias in our work and we'll be able to find bugs earlier in the stage, in an earlier stage before deploying to production or when reaching to the point where we want to deploy to production. Cool, so we're three days into the project and haven't run a single cell that contains fit. We want to train a model and we want it now. But just before we do that, keep in mind that we're conducting a research here. This is not a software development project. And exploring or hypothesizing without keeping track of the experiments is basically meaningless. We need to keep track of everything that we're doing. And the same as with large file versioning, a lot of tools emerge in recent years for experiment tracking. And in this case, I believe that it doesn't really matter with which hammer you choose to hit the nail, as long as you punch it through. So we have weights and biases, ML flow, comment ML, and many more. And by doing that, by also tracking our experiment in the sense where if I'm gonna conduct an experiment, and let's say Omer is gonna conduct an experiment, we're going to log the same hype base hyperparameters and the same metrics, and then we'll be able to... No, <laughs> this is Omar. Uh, so we'll be able to compare apples to apples. So we have the same metrics and the same hyperparameters, and we'll be, we will be able to choose the best experiment and then either double down on, so let's say hyperparameter tuning for it, or then deploy it to production. And by doing that, we're going to build a knowledge base for our project as we go, because we can keep in track of everything that we're doing. We'll be able to reproduce our, the experiment to some extent, because we're keeping track of the hyperparameters. So we'll be able to rerun the training. And also, we're going to avoid ad hoc recording that currently a lot of people are doing in a spreadsheet or whatnot. And in this case, we're keeping track of the same hyperparameters, the same metrics, the same artifacts and we can compare between works of different uh, team members. Awesome. So the deadline is closing in, and you find yourself going back and forth between data processing and modeling, data processing and modeling. And you start feeling the heat from your boss to the point where she decides to add two new team members to the project. But 
what now? Okay, so Omer, you're going to take cells 1 to 29. Uh, let's say Noah is going to take cells 30 to 60, and I'm going to take cells 60 and above. But Noah, keep in mind that cell number 36, it takes forever to run it, so just don't rerun it again. Well, this is not a way to collaborate with other people on a project. So what we want here, we want to use designated uh, notebooks for designated tasks. So a notebook pair task. So let's say we have a data processing task, so we'll have a designated notebook for data processing. We have a, a modeling task, so we're going to have a designated notebook for building our model, and so on and so on. And this way, when we uh, we, when we're going to scale the number of team members uh, on the same project, we'll be able to do it efficiently. Also, it's going to be much more easier to maintain, review, and debug our work. And last, we're going to have a clear structure to our project, meaning we know that the data processing step needs to take an input, the raw data, and it outputs a processed data. And then the modeling step, no, we know which type of or how it needs to receive the process data, so this is its input, and then what it's going to output, it's a trained model. So we have a clear structure, a clear DAG, as in DAGZUB, to our project. And this way, uh, we have a clear structure. It's also helpful for onboarding, but very much for maintaining. Okay, so we're six hours before the deadline, and we have one last training that we need to run. But the person in charge of modeling just called in sick. I just wish this week would be over with. So what you're going to do, you're going to probably connect to your favorite cloud provider, and there is no such thing. You're going to fire a monster machine. You're going to pull the entire uh, project with the latest version of your notebook, and you're going to run hit all cells. So cross your fingers that it's going to work, and run. Error retrieving dri driver version, kernel reported driver version not implemented. We're getting errors because our version of TensorFlow doesn't support this driver. Ah, I just wish this week would be over with. So in this sense, notebooks should be reproducible to the extent so anyone on the team can uh, take the notebook from where we left it and rerun it easily by and like put it, give it the same input and get the same output. And in this case, what I'm trying to say here that we should track all of our dependencies in our project. So the base case is going to be requirements.txt. But taking it to the next level, we also want to keep track of OS level dependencies. So which hardware we're using, uh, if we're using GPU, which type of GPU, which uh, 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 CUDA, ver CUDA version, if it connects to the TensorFlow that we're using. And we want to encapsulate everything. I would say dockerize everything. Um, so we will be able to rerun the, the notebook easily. And by doing that, we'll be able to reproduce our result easily. So reproducibility, it's an important thing in machine learning. We'll be able to iterate over our work easily. And we're going to also have a proper handoff between the ML team and the MLOps team that eventually needs to deploy the model to production. OK, so we've explored, process, version, build, train, and pickled our model. This is the time to push the deployment button. And we are ready to do so. So what we're going to do? We're going to probably send our notebook to the MLOps team and ask them to deploy it as an endpoint to production. Please don't do that. Yeah, this is the meme. OK, so don't deploy your models to production. There are so many reasons why not to use our, model, our notebooks in production. So first and foremost, there are no, like, there's a lot of uh, very uh, commonly used or well-established CI CD tools that are not supporting Jupyter Notebooks. And to use them, so they don't have it out of the box, so to use them, you're going to probably have to do a lot of hacking in the way. Also, most of the deployment tools re, uh, require a lot of cleaning up and packaging of our notebook, which will probably get to the point where the notebook is probably going to be treated or handed as a Python script. So why go through all this hassle? And I think, and also, uh, or the, mo the other thing is, that notebooks are not such a good team player in production. So you're probably going to use other tools in production that don't know how to handle with a format that underlies Jupyter Notebooks, which is basically a large JSON. And this leads us to the last principle, which is we want to use scripts for training and deployment. And by doing that, it will be much more easier to maintain our project 
uh, and also debug if we have something in production, if we have a bug in production, and it will reduce the downtime. We, um, also, scripts are more scalable than Jupyter Notebooks. And I feel like the last thing, which is the magical part, is that if you're going to use all the last six best practices, it's going to make the process of moving to production as easy as, in, in, as approving a pull request. So we can move much more faster to deploying our model to production. OK, so this brings us to the end of this session. Um, so we discussed today how to make our workflow when using Jupyter Notebooks in a production environment more producible, scalable, and will help us move much more faster. So a quick recap will be that first we want to host all of our code outside the Jupyter Notebooks. We want to host them in modules and then import them back to our notebooks. We want to version everything, so our code, our notebooks, our data, our models, etc. We want to have peer reviews uh, in early state, as early as it can be of the uh, in the pipeline of the building or building our model. We want to track our experiment. We want to use task-oriented notebooks or break down the spaghetti notebook into different tasks that we're uh, building. We want to track our environment setting and our OS level dependencies. And last, we want to use scripts for training and deploying our notebook. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining me today. Uh, it was very fun seeing you here and having an in-person event. Thank you all for the, also for the PyData organizers. So Uri, Gal, Dean, everyone, all the team. Um, and I would love to connect with everyone here. So basically what I'm doing at Dagzub is talking with technical people that are building ML projects, listening to their challenges and what they're facing when trying to build models to production. So I'd love to chat with you so you can DM me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And I'd love to hear what are the challenges that you're facing uh, and how are you overcoming them or if you can overcome them and maybe there is a solution out there for you. So with that, thank you very much and have a, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, any questions? Uh, thank you. I did. <laughs> I did not understand what are you at, at what step you're stopping working with the uh, notebooks and start doing working with scripts. Are you, are you working with notebooks only for like uh, prototyping? Okay, so the gifts is going to drive you crazy. So let's go back just to the beginning. So in the very beginning of our workflow, and this is the first principle. And I think like I know conceptually changing workflow is very hard. So this is the step that I would recommend generally to start from. What we want to do, we want to take the code that we're hosting in the notebook, export it into Python module, and then import it back the, without any dependency of what's going on in the notebook. And so this is going to lead you into like having a notebook with only, fun with, only with functions that is going to work as a pipeline. Okay? And this way, you will be able to utilize the plots that, or the, interactive, the, the interactivity of the Jupyter notebook. But once you want to move to tr the training, basically what you need to do is take the pipeline that you have in your notebook, copy it to some main function, main uh, script, and then run the main script. So basically, it's part of the process. You start by exporting the code to Python module, then importing back. And once you want to train or deploy, you basically take in the content of your notebook and transition it into the relevant script. So it can be a training script. It can be a main script. It can be a processing script. Etc. And this way, you can also build a DAG to your project that interacts with all the other components, and you can reproduce the entire pipeline from scratch. Did it answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it did. Awesome. Uh, can I get another uh, question? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. At the start We're going to charge double. Uh, no problem. <laughs> we have the money. <laughs> um, at the start of the uh, the presentation of the slides, yeah. I heard about Netflix using uh, notebooks in production. Uh, can you uh, elaborate, please? So basically, the reason I'm using this meme is because Netflix basically built an entire orchestration around deploying their models to production. And probably in 99.9 .9 of cases, you are not Netflix. So you don't have the MLOps team or the men slash woman power to build such an orchestration. So it's going to be very hard for you to build such a thing. It's I can refer you to two blog posts that were uh, written by Netflix where they describe the architecture. 
but I mainly not focused on how to do so, because in most cases it's going to be very hard for companies to do it. Uh, but I will reference it in the, I don't know where, we have a stack or something, will we? No, nothing? Okay. I'll ping you on whatever, on LinkedIn. Thank you. Ping me. <laughs> okay, no problem. As you said in the beginning, versioning notebooks is like nightmare. Exactly. So you have like, do you know of any tools that like help you do it better or easier? So I'm going to split my answer to two. First and foremost, Jupyter Notebooks can become very heavy because there's a lot of plots there. And then versioning with Git, it's become very heavy for Git to version. And this is where we can utilize those uh, data versioning tool to also version our notebooks because they can handle large files and they're going to host it in a remote storage. Uh, so this is for the versioning and for diffing, communicating and stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, add-ons like uh, NBDime, ReviewNB and stuff like that. At Dagzub, so I'm, I hate to talk about Dagzub when I'm uh, speaking, but basically what we enable to users is basically to push their notebooks to your repo. Then you can diff cells there, communicate over cells, uh, and also they can be in your bucket or in your Git server. So it doesn't matter with which tool you're versioning them. Um, but if you're not using Dagzub and you're using other tools, then you can. there's a lot of open source or add-ons that you can use for versioning, uh, not for versioning, but for diffing, uh, communicating over notebooks. Also, there are some for linting um, and for debugging, but it's like researching for the one that fits your needs or the, the pain that you have and use it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you.